Is rejecting God's design just a bad idea or worse? Welcome to Answers News for Monday, March 11, 2024. And in today's top story, we discovered that abusing your hormones can cause health problems. Who knew? All right, I am Brian Osborne with Patricia Engler, Rocket Rob Webb. We're here with Answers News in a live studio audience. Will you guys clap and make yourselves known to those Come who are watching? Come on There we go. Yeah. There we go. That ain't no um, golf clap. That's, that's a good that's, clap. That's, that's a NASCAR yeah. clap right there. Nice to see people coming back as spring starts to come back. Crowds start to grow larger again. That's always fun to see. Welcome. Welcome to those who are watching online. Let's mm -hmm. jump into our first article for today for our Answers News. The title is, Leet Messages Show Top Pro-LGBT Doctors No Transgender Hormones Cause Cancer and Death. And so doctors who work for WPATH which is an acronym for World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you say WEPETH or WEF. <laughs> I don't know if they even try that with. <laughs> we'll go with the acronym, all right? But these doctors basically have privately admitted in their own interactions with each other that transgender hormones can cause liver tumors, sterilization, death, cancer, and other things as well. And these are leaked internal communications uh, that basically show these doctors who are on the gender-affirming care side. They are part of that movement. So they are pro-LGBTQ. They're pro of that whole thing. They even recognize these problems, but still want to proceed with the movement anyway. Yeah, I mean, just it's another reminder that our culture really hates God, it hates truth, so it hates children, hates the family unit, right? So we're seeing a war on children that's happening through a lot of these so-called uh, gender-affirming care, all of these drugs, operations. It's the same old lie that we've been hearing about ever since the beginning, since Genesis chapter 3, which says, you know, God is not the creator, you are. You, could, you get to decide what is right and wrong. You get to decide what is your identity. And so, again and again, we, we always see these, these gender-affirming cares, and it's, it's no surprise, right? It's no shocking. You go against God's Design, it's that bad things are, are going to happen. You're, we're going to see things like tumors and sterilization, death, and all these things. It just reminds me of Isaiah 5:20. Woe to those who call evil good and get good evil. In other words, woe to those who call uh, cancer and death and all these horrible diseases so-called gender-affirming care. Um, I just I just think about all of the doctors that are actually prescribing these drugs, these operations. They're going to have to answer to a holy God, right? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is straight up just child abuse that's happening to these children with all these drugs, all these hormones and that it really needs to stop and as a church we need to wake up to this war around us that's raging around us ever since Genesis chapter 3 let's get involved right let's make sure we boldly speak up for these children that are being physically mutilated by these drugs by these hormones and then they also go on to say here which I thought was even uh, worse that a lot of these transitions are actually happening as early as the age of four yeah, you heard that right. At the age of four, these kids are actually receiving these hormones, these operations. It just reminds me of my son, RJ. He just turned five over the weekend. Happy birthday, by the way, buddy. Um, he just turned five over the weekend. And one of the things he likes to run around, uh, he, he runs around pretending like he's Spider-Man, right? He'll come up to me, I'm Spider-Man, I'm Batman. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's cool, man. We can play that game all day. Uh, but if RJ comes up to me and says, no, I'm Susie, I'd be like, well, hold on just a second, right? Um, you can be Batman can't be Susie, right? We got to talk about that. But it would just be as ridiculous if I were to take the drugs, the operations to try to turn him into Batman or to try to turn him into Superman than it would be for a lot of these other hormones. And so again, as our, our job as parents, our job as fathers is to protect our children, right? We don't give them these, these horrible drugs that then destroy themselves. We're, our job is to protect and lead our family. Yeah, and you mentioned, I noticed uh, just the world view shift in here from viewing God as the creator. If God's our creator, then he defines who he made us to be. We're creatures, we're made in his image, and uh, we flourish best when we live in according with God's designs. So what we're seeing here is a world view shift where instead of God being the authority for truth, we're making human feelings and human thoughts the authority. Uh, so that turns humans into self-creators who look at the world. That's just the raw, re uh, raw material you and the world are raw material for creating yourself in your internal image of whatever you want to be based on how you feel right now, that leads to a few major shifts in what we view medicine as. For instance, you're changing from respect for persons to respect for autonomy, this idea of radical freedom that you look inside, decide your truth, and then make your own radical decisions based on that. Uh, that's a new staple of biomedical ethics. It's the basis for a lot of American law right now. It's why we have things like transgenderism and abortion, things like that. It also shifts doctors from being covenantal caregivers to being contracted technicians in the service. Like we're going to hire you as our specialist to build us in the image of what we want to be or to uh, 
murder our children, that type of thing. Same with, uh, it's a shift from the sanctity of life, protecting life, to relief of suffering. And suffering can be whatever you define it on the inside. And ethicists like Dr. Nigel Cameron have talked about how this leads to a change in medicine where instead of being about um, valuing life, it leads to turning medicine into a power play against the vulnerable. So people like uh, gender confused uh, kids or um, embryos, comatose patients, uh, any time that someone defines relief in suffer, uh, relief of suffering in a way that um, could lead to harming those people, this is justified in the name of this radical autonomy. Yeah, and it's really interesting, as you're kind of saying, Patricia, this shift in foundational thinking from God defining what truth is to so now individuals can define their own truth. And, and really, in a nutshell, what you were describing was what I like, like to call Disney uh, theology or ideology. And Disney's whole mantra, if you watch a Disney movie, old or young, really, it doesn't matter which one, uh, newer ones or older ones, their, their main idea is still the same. Truth is this, you must follow your heart. heart you can be right? anything. Follow your heart, look inside, look at your inner feelings, follow your desires, and that's who you'll find, who you, that's where you'll find your true identity, and you really flesh that out. And the Bible says following your heart is a horrible idea. Because it is deceitful and wicked and broken by sin, and your heart will lead you astray into brokenness and catastrophic brokenness if you actually pursue it so far. And so the world says, no, follow your heart. The Bible says, no, follow Christ. He is your creator. He knows how you work best. And he understands that we have broken feelings because we're part, we're connected, we're actually uh, impacted by the fall. When man sinned, it broke all of creation, even broke the way we think. And so we perceive reality wrongly. We perceive ourselves wrongly because of sin. And that's why people can be so broken to see their own gender wrongly because we've been broken by sin. And what fixes that? The word of the living God and a renewed mind and a changed heart through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that's why as Christians, we are so on about not merely giving answers about gender ideology and combating horrible things like this and bringing to the light okay. the deeds of darkness, but also pointing people to the truth where they find their identity and their salvation, which is in Christ and Christ alone. Don't follow your heart, follow after Christ. Amen. Amen. And speaking on God's word too, one of the quotes in here from Robert Clark, he's a director of the uh, Alliance Defending Freedom. He says, no child is ever born in the wrong body. Children depend on adults to guide and empower them to feel comfortable and confident in their own skin, not to push them down a dangerous and irreversible path of transition. And like Brian was saying, that is the ultimate truth. That is our ultimate foundation. It's God's word, right? So even though a lot of these gender medicines, these gender operations are truly uh, damaging and harmful, regardless, that's not ultimately why it's wrong. That's ultimately not why it's sinful. It's wrong because who says? Is it because man says or is it because God says? It's because God says. Because God says it is wrong. The Bible makes it very clear that we are either male or female, two genders, two sexes, and one man or woman, right? And so it's really going with a lot of these gender-affirming medicines. It's rebellion against his design, right? And so really the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart, like Brian was saying. And what these people need is they need the change of a new heart. They need to have new desires. They need to be made into a new creation that can only happen through the gospel. First Corinthians 6, uh, the Apostle Paul says, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he lists a whole bunch of sins like sexual morality, homosexuality, idolatry. And then he says, and such were some of you, right? You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. So it's a hope of the gospel is to become a new creation in Christ. So your true identity is not by pretending to be something you're not, right? Your true identity can be in Christ. And that's what we need to be anchored on. That's right. And then without a smooth transition to the next article, we're going straight to migrating animals. That's go. right. No segue whatsoever. Just a cold U-turn to a new migrating subject. So here we go. Animals. I got no segue at all. But new research shows migrating animals learn by experience. And so this is a bunch of researchers that put together this research that has shown migrating animals Migrating animals refine their behavior as they get older, suggesting that experiential learning is an important part of a successful migration. And so what they noted in the research is they followed around a bunch of these storks, I believe, if I remember correctly, 250 white storks across southern Germany and Austria for seven years, 2013 and 2020. And they would follow their migration patterns. They would follow the patterns of the entire group and individual storks within the group. And what they found was pretty interesting. And that is the younger storks, when they migrated, of course, instincts play a big part of this. But as they're refining those instincts and getting better directions for those migration patterns, the younger storks would 
they would take the longer routes. They would actually go and explore a little bit more where the older storks just wanted to get where they were going and took the shorter route, okay? And so it's really interesting. You see this change from the younger storks to the older storks and the shorter paths that they take. And I, I was talking with a group earlier. I wondered if they looked at male and female storks and how they did this. Because the females may look around a bit more, but the males are like, let's just get there. We've got to break yeah. records. We've got to beat our we last time from last year. Just no get directions. There. Just beeline. No <laughs> stopping for the bathroom. We're going to get there. Uh, but what this study really showed is that, yes, animals uh, being made by God have amazing programming, amazing instincts to do things like migration. But also in that amazingly intricate, complicated programming is the ability to learn as well within a certain field and use that information to migrate even better. Yeah, absolutely. This is really just good observational science, mm-hmm. which the Bible gives us the worldview that we can do good observational science because we have that foundation for the world making sense, for logic, for scientific knowledge, for knowing things in the first place. And when we start with biblical assumptions, uh, that is what gives science like the, the best foundation for going forward and for asking the right questions in the first place. So this article didn't even really talk about evolution all that much. Which is nice. Which is I was nice. Surprised. Yeah, it I was, was refreshing. And you can see that this matches what we'd predict from a biblical worldview uh, because God God made really great designed uh, creatures, we would expect that when he tells them, like, go forth and fill the earth, uh, multiply, he gave that demand uh, after creation as well as after the flood, we would expect that a good designer would engineer creatures with good design systems to be able to learn and adapt to a changing world in order to do that. So, yeah, it's great confirmation of a biblical worldview. Yeah, as I was reading this article, I kept waiting for him, like, where is evolution? Where is climate change? Climate change. Where is the global warming? Because every time we have one of these articles, that's, those are the only few things that they always have in there. But they say, yeah, like Brian was saying, as these birds age, as they gain more experience, as, as they get older, right, rather than stopping to explore new places, they're trying to get there more quickly, more directly, having these so-called novel shortcuts, trying to straighten their routes. In other words, like when you get older, when you're on the road trip, right, you start learning all those shortcuts to try to get to the grocery store or the movie theater, wherever you need to go. And so, uh, again, like Patricia was saying, great observational science, no mention of evolution here. It just reminds you how stupid evolution really is, right, and how foolish it is that, um, that they the evolutionary explanation just doesn't fly with this kind of explanation <laughs> here. It doesn't fly. <laughs> I got it. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it just shows God's awesome design. He really is the master engineer. And so it's just yeah, an yeah. amazing uh, confirmation that what we see in nature really does confirm what we read about in the Bible. And again, those amazing instincts that they have come from programming, come from information. But information always comes from a mind, not in an inanimate matter. And so it's a great confirmation of an intelligent designer who programmed those things. And what we don't see, and of course the article, as we already said, doesn't talk much about evolution, which was a breath of fresh air for one of these types of articles. But what we don't see are storks creating other vehicles to fly in. Now flying's getting hard nowadays. Let's make an airplane. All right, with air conditioning and a sound system, and we can get to there using this sort of biodegradable resource. We don't see any of that. There's a limited range for their intellect, how God has programmed them. So they're amazing what they do, but they're not creative beings like we are as humans. We are made in God's image distinct from the other animals. And so there's a distinct line of demarcation between us and the animals I've represented here as well. Being able to fly like a stork would be pretty cool, though, Brian. Uh, I'm just uh, saying. Being, uh, flying would be awesome, no <laughs> doubt about that, right? Moving on to the next article. This article talks about not flying but raining. Scientists discover proof of when it rained for 2 million years on Earth. So I think they went to Seattle. Yeah, anyone here from Washington, right. Oregon? <laughs> <laughs> it's still raining. It's like Ireland. Anyone from Ireland here? I spent two months in Ireland. I, I, I did a summer abroad trip, and that place felt like it rained for literally two million years. Yeah, do you want to share the intense uh, studies you were doing while you were in Ireland? Yeah, so I took uh, some really intense college classes for my engineering degree. I took digital photography, and I took traditional Irish music. Where, uh, <laughs> going to rocket science. Some really great elective courses that I took. Literally, for my traditional Irish music uh, class, I had to go to the pubs, watch a live performance, and then write a reflection on it, turn it in on Monday. That, so is, pretty, that is some hard work. Pretty hard work there. That's impressive credentials. <laughs> then I had to take pictures and turn them in. And so, but it was raining all the time, so it was hard to take there pictures. There we go, yeah. And so basically, they're looking at particular rock layers. And the rock layers they're looking at were studied back in the 70s and 80s. That's a real long time ago. It really is. <laughs> I wasn't even alive. Yeah. And uh, so look at these rock layers, and some of the features of these sedimentary rock layers point to a lot of water uh, that may have rained for a really long time. Now, they say these rock layers are looking at were around maybe 200, 230, 200, or 300 million years old, somewhere in that time frame, uh, which 
Again, in evolutionary thinking, they just redefine the time frames. The so rock layers, they define as long periods of time, times between the rock layers, added a bunch of time to import their mythology of evolution. The time frame is much shorter. And really, the rock layers, rightly understood, are a great confirmation of a rapid recent formation not that long ago during a global flood, roughly 4,500 years ago. So their time frame is entirely off. But mm -hmm. we can look at the same structure of the rock layers and realize, yeah, certain things about these point to a lot of water. Well, there's an event in the Bible that talks about a lot of water. Yeah. There definitely is. And you see that evidence for the flood in this article. So it's talking about um, like a dry period and then rainy period. So we don't want to say that that was the beginning of the flood because these rock layers that they're looking at would have been like around when dinosaurs were starting to be buried. So we would Triassic layers. Yeah, view yep. that as being about midway through the flood when you're starting to see some of the, um, the land animals being buried more. So the article that the study cited, though, does talk about how this explosion of dinosaurs uh, go, corresponds with increased rainfall, um, a lot of uh, movement in the oceans and the atmospheres, uh, volcanic eruptions, mass extinction events, all that matches a global flood period. They are talking about also periods of dryness in between um, some of these, these times, which you might wonder, how, does, how do dry periods fit with a flood? But actually, if you hop on our website and look at some of Dr. Andrew Snelling's articles, uh, you can see he's talking about how as the flood was happening, there would have been things like tides still going on and tsunamis, <coughs> so there would have been times where uh, water level was rising and going down and rising and going down, which is how you have things like dinosaur footprints being fossilized as they're walking when it's dry and then it gets covered over. So we wouldn't actually be surprised within a biblical worldview to see some uh, variation in the, the moisture of the rock layers as well. So yeah, altogether, it is good evidence of the global flood, which is all over the world. I encourage you to hop on our website and learn more about that. Yeah, they go on to say that the reasons lead to, uh, there's like a huge rise in humidity, maybe it was uh, due to massive volcanic eruptions. They talk about a, a spike in global warming. There it is, global warming. Uh, subsequently, heating the oceans, causing more moisture to be in the air. Okay, and then they kind of just flip on the dime all of a sudden. They say, and this whole wet period was brilliant for the dinosaurs. It didn't go extinct, right? Um, but again, if we go back to the biblical worldview, we know that most of the dinosaurs did get wiped out from the flood. All, only uh, Noah and his family and the two of every kind went onto the ark to be saved. And so, again, just kind of points to the fact that you start with the wrong assumptions, you're going to get the wrong conclusions. That's why it's so important as Christians we have the right foundation to interpret the evidence in front of us. Because we all have the same evidence. We have the same rock layers. We have the same fossils. But, again, it comes down to the interpretation based on whatever starting point, whatever assumption that we have. You can either start with God's word or not God's word. In other words, man's word. That's what we're seeing here today. We're seeing them taking that interpretation, reinterpreting it based on their own uh, worldview, their own man's word, and it just really doesn't hold water at the end of the day. <laughs> I was waiting for it. I knew there was a water <laughs> pun coming in there somewhere. Uh, and it's interesting, too. They talk about the idea of Pangea. Uh, most Christians don't realize the Bible seems to align with that as well. In Genesis 1, 9, at creation, it says God let, had all the water be gathered to one place. If the water is gathered to one place, that implies the land is in one major place. So originally one major supercontinent before the flood. What happened to the major supercontinent? The answer is the flood. The Bible says that on that day, the initiation of the flood, all the springs of the great deep burst forth. That's literally referring to subterranean water mm -hmm. bursting forth through the Earth's crust, moving the Earth's crust catastrophically, which caused lots of tectonic activity, volcanic activity, and of course all the water from underneath and rains from above flooding the Earth. This event of the flood wrecked this world. Most Christians don't really realize the point of the flood was to destroy both the people and the earth, Genesis 6, 13. That was part of the purpose of the flood. That flood wrecked this world catastrophically. And also, after the flood is a perfect time for an ice age. And to get an ice age, you need warm ocean waters, which is what they're talking about mm -hmm. in this article. Post-flood, all the volcanic activity, lava's pouring into the oceans, subterranean water be very warm. Oceans are warm, causes lots of evaporation, lots of moisture into the sky, and moisture comes down. But then you get cooler continents from blocked sunlight from dust clouds all around the earth from volcanic activity. Cool continents, warm oceans, exactly what you need for a post-flood ice age. And so biblically, we can explain all these things in an amazing fashion. We really can. We got a lot more of that on this book here called A Flood of Evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, 40 chapters talking about the rock layers and the fossils and the features of those things, how they really amazingly confirm biblical history. If you're into geology, paleontology, you will love this book. Good answers. Not too long. Chapter per answer. Really well done. Yep.
a lot of good stuff in there. And one of the other things that it mentions too is just the importance of actually standing on God's word, starting in Genesis and, and starting with that biblical creation account. Because a lot of the Christians that go and they, they try to take the millions of years and evolution, they try to fit that into the Bible. Now all of a sudden you have to believe that the flood was a local flood. It was a local event rather than a global flood. So if you guys like to learn more about that, make sure you check out this powerful resource. Good stuff. All right. Moving on to the next article, although I wish we could maybe stay on this one for a little bit longer. Yeah. yeah. Can we go back to the Yeah, here the we go. One. Satanic temple threatens to sue if schools bar its leaders from chaplain program in Florida. And so in Florida, the legislature there has got two bills kind of going through the process right now where they are trying to get uh, volunteer chaplains available to students in public schools. And basically, these volunteer chaplains will be on a list that will be available to the students. The parents could look at the list. All the volunteer chaplains have to go through a background check, get approved that way. They're on the list available. The parents can look at the chaplains and say, oh, yeah, I would like my kid to get counsel from this particular chaplain. They can sign off on that person, and then the kid can go to that person during school time and get counseling from that particular person. And so they're trying to get this in place over in Florida. Well, the Satanic Temple wants to be part of the program, too. They want their chaplains to be part of the available volunteer list uh, to be available to be counselors for these public school kids. And if you look at what they're really doing, it kind of seems like they're just offended that uh, this idea is being proposed at all. It's like they're kind of just throwing a fly in the ointment. Basically, they're saying, hey, you've got to include us in this list. If not, that's religious discrimination. Therefore, you have to cancel the whole thing. Or if you include us, now, haha, you're including satanic temple chaplains in your program. How funny is that? Or how ironic is that to them? It would sing. I don't know their motives, but it seems to be that way from the article. And uh, basically, they kind of go through talking about how their uh, threats from the Satanic Temple to sue if they're not allowed to participate, and how really this is all an attempt to proselytize and so forth and so on. It kind of struck me funny, though, as you're reading this. It said all the volunteers who could be chaplains or counselors for the schools have to go through a background check. And think about it. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if you went through a background check, and in the background check it revealed that you were in a satanic temple, you would not be allowed in a school. But now today, is this supposed to be like the grounds on which they are to be allowed into the school? Yeah, so it's just a good opportunity to pray for wisdom for the senators. It's hard in a free, constitutional, pluralistic society to make good laws that allow Christians to do things without also allowing everybody else to do the same thing. So a great opportunity to pray for wisdom for, right. for the senators as well. And also, it is good to see that, you know, they're trying to put these safeguards in, like that parental consent background check. That's the type of thing that you would need to be able to do. And also just um, exercising biblical discernment. A lot of Christian chaplains will tell you that chaplains see is a wild world with all kinds of different <laughs> um, perspectives represented in there. So even if you get a Christian chaplain, you don't necessarily know what they're going to be counseling your kids to say. Uh, I went to a university in Canada that I was visiting one time and saw a business card for a Wiccan chaplain on the campus. So uh, just exercise biblical discernment there as well. Mm. Good point. Yeah, and like Brian was saying, it's just amazing how far this country has fallen in this post-Christian culture. Think about just one generation ago, right? This would have been completely unspeakable, just totally unthinkable. And just, it's a reminder of this Romans 1 culture that we're seeing happening all around us where God is just giving people over to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. We're seeing that here. And so it's just also another reminder that no one is neutral, right? Neutrality is a myth. Everyone has a worldview. Everyone has a religion. So this whole kind of argument is kind of based on the false premise that schools are so supposed to be neutral, right? They're not supposed to have any, any religion. Um, but here's the thing, right? They didn't kick out religion. What they did is they kicked out Christianity and they've replaced it with the religion of secular humanism, right? Prayer's been thrown out, the Ten Commandments have thrown out, the Bible's been thrown out of the classrooms. And so now we're seeing with evolution, with millions of years, with, the, with Darwinian teaching, we're seeing the religion of humanism being indoctrinated on all of these kids in public schools today. So just be aware, if you're a parent, maybe you have a kid in, in public school, this, this is happening to them left, right, and center. And one of the symptoms, just, this is just a symptom of the root cause, right? And what is the root cause? Well, it's a compromise of God's word. It's the rejection of God's word, both, I would say, outside and inside the church. We're seeing more and more Christians today within the church that are compromising God's word, starting in Genesis. And here's the thing. When we, when we compromise Genesis, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect everything else. If we get Genesis wrong, we're going to get the, the entire Bible wrong, right? You open up that door just a little bit, all of a sudden, uh, if Genesis isn't really true, how do you know John 3.16 is true? How do you know Romans 10, 9 isn't true. And so we're seeing this massive exodus from the church because the church is not standing on God's authoritative word from the beginning. So it's just time for the church to be salt and light in this culture again. Definitely. 
And then as you were saying all that, two things kind of just occurred to me as I was thinking about the article. It's funny. Parents have to be informed about what chaplains their students get. But in some states, parents are not informed that their child is getting an abortion or counseled for an abortion or to get new hormones to change their gender. In some places, that's flying under the radar. You see how contradictory that is? And then also, we were kind of talking backstage beforehand. It's interesting. Within the satanic temple, many of those in that particular practice aren't actually Satan worshipers, at least not an actual being. They're atheists who worship the idea of Satan, like the idea of autonomy, that you should be your own God. That's what they worship. So he's a good kind of uh, idol for them, if you will. And they follow that particular idol. But they don't believe in him. They don't believe in anything actually supernatural. But if you don't believe in anything beyond this world, my question to them is, why do you care? I mean, without God, there are no moral absolutes. You're saying it's not fair that you're not in there, but that implies there's a right and a wrong. If there's no right or wrong, how can you say something is wrong? But they're implying, they're borrowing from the biblical worldview. They're borrowing biblical capital. And then he accuses the, uh, the pushers of the bill of having a false rationale, a false logic. But logic is non-tangible. Where do you get logic from in a secular materialistic worldview? It only is consistently found within the biblical worldview. So it's interesting how much they borrow from the biblical worldview. Yeah, things like truth, knowledge, logic, morality, those things are only possible because God's word is true, yet you see them inconsistently borrow that all the way through and through as we read in this article. If you guys would like to learn more about um, in terms of religions, a lot of the world religions and cults that are out there, um, we have a great book series, book one through three. We have three books on that talks about um, just the atheist, the humanistic types of religions that are out there, specifically in book number three. If you guys want to learn more about that. And just, it really comes down to, like we said earlier, um, you can either start with God's word or not God's word, right? That's, those are really the, the only two options. And when you start with not God's word, that's when we see all of these other man-made religions that are starting to come out. And so we're seeing this left, right, and center, not just in our school systems, right? We're seeing it in our government and our core systems today. And so, um, again, that's why it's so important that we go back to reforming the church. Let's get back to biblical authority within the church so we can influence this culture. Amen. Amen. And speaking of the need of that influence, moving on to the next article, probably the last one we'll cover for today. A symbol of evil, students deplore a pro-abortion statue at a Texas university, the University of Houston is where it's actually at. So the article's about students at the University of Houston are speaking out against a statue recently erected on campus that was originally named in homage of the so-called right to abortion. And they say it looks satanic because, well, just look at it. It yeah. looks satanic. Uh, you got the braided hair up in like ram's horns. You have the tentacles for arms instead of arms. You have this golden statue like it's going to be worshipped. It does definitely give you those kind of satanic vibes as other satanic depictions do. And basically there are students who are complaining about this saying, hey, listen, we don't want this on our campus. It's a depiction of evil. Uh, and one girl said, when I see this statue, I don't see empowerment and freedom, which is what the author wanted as they give the statue to fight for empowerment and freedom, to fight for pro-abortion rights. She says, I see this statue as a physical representation of evil lies. And so there's basically a conflict going on between those who want to keep it there and those who want to take it down. The article is kind of all about that. Yeah, I... What stood out to me about this is, you know, putting a, a bit of a positive spin on it. So looking at three ways that this statue actually represents an opportunity for Christians in our contemporary post-Christian world. So sorry that I'm going to be a little bit long here, yeah, but a little, little speech time. I, I got so, a soapbox. You can stand on it. Okay, go. awesome. Thanks. So <laughs> point number one, it is an opportunity to learn something about the cultural power of art. So this artist was actually successful in what she was doing in that she was trying to get people talking and thinking about a particular concept, namely abortion, and that's exactly what happened. So as Christians, we want to be able to learn from this cultural power of art and use it rightly for uh, art that celebrates beauty and life and goodness and God um, and not actually contribute tribute to the success of evil art by, in a sense, glorifying it more than we need to. Um, when Christians are acting threatened by this chunk of metal, we are giving the dark side a victory that it really doesn't deserve. So that was point number one. Good point. Uh, next, thank you. <laughs> Second, it's an opportunity to confront the reality of where we are as a society. So on the one hand, it is right to be grieved when we see evil being celebrated. It grieves the Holy Spirit in us. It grieves us to see the evil consequences of sin, um, how it hurts people, how it hurts society. It is completely right for us to even ask people, do you really want to live in a society that celebrates people with power killing less powerful people because they don't want them around? Is that the type of consequence you want? But on the other hand, we shouldn't be surprised to see evil in an evil world. First John reminds us the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. Um, and when you're in a country that worships another religion, that's what you're going to see around you. But leads us to point three, that provides an opportunity 
opportunity to practice Romans 12, 21 and overcome evil with good. Uh, so this is a summons for Christians to get involved from their community on their college campus. Uh, when I was in college, there were community members, at least one wonderful retired pastor who came to the campus and went on prayer walks with us, with the students. He would do just prayer initiatives with the students. It's an opportunity for Christians from the wider community to get involved in the campus ministry, supporting students, praying for students, praying for uh, the people there who don't know God yet. It's an opportunity, again, to create art that celebrates goodness, an opportunity to try to love those who are hurting from past abortions, to yep. help them connect with good resources, good biblical counseling, people like that one student who had been traumatized by this, and an opportunity to bring people together to organize, say, worship initiatives, celebrating that Jesus is the victor. Greater is he that is in us than he who is, uh, than he is in the world, you know? Amen. So yeah. three, three, three opportunities there that we can take uh, Take what is being used for evil, and God has plans to use it for good. Yep, I'll take that soapbox now. <laughs> that was great. Go for it. <laughs> no, like Ryan was saying, it really is satanic. I mean, because it really is child sacrifice to the God of self, to the God of convenience, to the God of comfort. That's what we're seeing here. And one of the things I thought was interesting is um, Derek Cooper, the member of the Student Government Association, the one who's now trying to, uh, originally he didn't care about the statue, but now he does because he believes that young white men shouldn't have a say in what any woman does with her body. So um, he probably can't even define what a woman, in, woman is in the first place. But um, just try that with slavery, true. right? Just, um, just a few hundred years ago, it's basically like saying, uh, you can't talk about slavery unless you're a slave owner. You can't talk about this unless you're that. So you just see that logical inconsistency all the way through, through, right? And it just goes back to Genesis chapter 3, like we said. It's the same attack that we're seeing here today. Man decides what is right and wrong, you know, to become your own God. Um, did God really say that abortion is wrong? And of course, we start with God's word. We know it's wrong because from the moment the fertilization, that child is tremendously precious. That child is deserving of life because that child is made in the image of God. And so, and what we're seeing in their culture today is the Bible says all who hate who hate God ultimately love death. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a war on the preborn today. And like Patricia was hinting at earlier, abortion is not the unforgivable sin, right? There is forgiveness in Christ for every sin that's out there. Even though uh, these mothers and fathers are guilty of the, uh, the horrible sin of abortion, there is forgiveness that Jesus Christ, he really can wash away as far as the east is from the west, every single sin that's out there. You can be reconciled to God the Father. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that is the hope we have. Amen. And I was thinking as you guys were talking, we do shows like this not to gripe and complain about the culture. It is to bring awareness that we yeah. understand what's happening. Why? So we can engage this culture with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, with biblical answers and a biblical worldview rooted in truth, because we have the answers. And what a glorious time to have answers, because people are asking a lot of questions. And it's kind of front and center. You really can't dodge these issues. It's right out in public. They have satanic idols literally in the public square, idols celebrating abortion. We see transgender issues being pushed uh, without hesitancy in our culture and so many other things. What a great time to engage people with the truth of God's word, starting in Genesis, understanding who we are, our identity, our, our authority rooted in God's word from the very first verse, building that biblical worldview from a biblical foundation, and you have answers. And we tell people all the time, the answers aren't hard. You don't need a PhD to defend your faith. You need a biblical worldview. Trust God's word. Take every thought captive to obedience to Christ, and you can have answers to defend your faith and proclaim the gospel, the gospel that our culture so desperately needs. And so our passion truly is to share these things, to bring an awareness, to excite us, and then to empower us to give answers to proclaim the gospel. This is not a woe is me. This is praise God for the opportunity to share his truth and to be salt and light. And that really is our hope for you guys as you're here at the museum, those watching online. If you're watching online, come to the Creation Museum, come to the Ark Encounter. You'll see more of those answers. Go to the website. Tons of stuff all free there. Go to the Answers YouTube channel. So many great resources to get access to answers to defend and to proclaim. Speaking of a couple of resources, we've got something to show here at the very end. We got truth for everybody. We got answers for everybody from toddlers to those uh, past 100. But this one is for the toddlers or those past 100 if you want it. That's fine. But a Bible, a Bible curriculum for toddlers, a really great book, big fold up book with big pictures, big words, big letters, simple concepts, yep. but good core biblical Very truths. powerful one. I have three little ones myself yep. at home. And so um, and one, of the, one of their favorite books right here is this one, just five simple truths. You just go over and over again. And just it's so important to lay down that foundation for kids that they need at that early age. So it's such a powerful resource. If you're a parent today, make sure you guys get this resource into your home. 
And then building off that, we got our Answers Bible curriculum, two different editions for that, the homeschooling curriculum and the Sunday school curriculum. Goes through the entire Bible chronologically for multiple years. Uh, gives you apologetics as you go through. It's age integrated in Sunday school from pre-K to adult. Everybody's learning the same stuff at the same time. So much great resource. And we're actually tracing the gospel thread all the way through. So you've seen the gospel from the Old Testament through the New because the whole focus of the Bible is Christ all the way through. Such a great resource. Again, for homeschooling or Sunday school, check that out online at AnswersBibleCurriculum.com. And we are out of time. I hope you guys have had a good time here with us and you've been encouraged and challenged to stand on God's word, defend the faith, and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. See you guys next time. God bless.